Plato's Republic is the cornerstone of Western philosophy. It is a masterful work which engages a plethora of philosophical themes. The Republic is one of the greatest works of art ever produced. It is in league with Shakespeare's Lear, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. It is exceedingly beautiful in passages, a work of extraordinary literary achievement. It is indeed a philosophical masterpiece. And as such, Plato articulates many of the fundamental concepts of Western philosophy. The text offers us an explanation of the logical theory of contradiction and Plato's view of the human soul. It offers us engaging questions and answers about fundamental issues, issues of what exists, what it is that we can know, and how we ought to go about living our lives. In the Republic, Plato's setting out really to take on the received wisdoms of his day. The received wisdom of Plato's day was the tradition of Homer. In Homer's Iliad, you know, Homer tells the story of what it's like to be the best sort of person you can be. How should we, as kids, grow up? What should we aspire to be when we grow up? The ideal figure, the Homeric hero, is, of course, Achilles. And what are Achilles' characteristics? What are Achilles' traits as a human being? His prowess, his courage, his violence, his desire for revenge. Recall in Homer's Iliad that Achilles' best friend, Patroclus, his beloved friend, is killed on the battlefield. The war between the Achaeans and the Trojans. At the city walls of Troy, Patroclus is slain by the Trojan Hector. Achilles hears about the death of his friend, dons his armor, goes out into the battlefield, finds Hector, and kills him. But that does not sate his desire, his passion. He takes the dead Hector's body, binds up his feet, attaches them to the back of his chariot, and rides three times around the walls of Troy, Hector's home city, to humiliate the great Hector in front of his hometown in front of the people that, he, that loved him most. The Homeric hero, then, is a warrior hero, a hero of violence, a hero who has great passions and indulges them. In the Republic, Plato seeks to transvalue that notion of what it is to be best. In Plato's Republic, we find not Achilles as the great hero, not that the point of life is violence and revenge. We find instead the transvaluation of Achilles with the platonic hero, Socrates. Plato believed that Homer and Homer's heroic notions had a pernicious influence on Greek society. Plato believed indeed that Homer's hero had a pernicious or evil influence on the people of ancient Greek, of ancient Greece. And if we are today to accept the notion of Homer's hero, Achilles, as best a pernicious or evil influence on us, Instead, he offers us, in the course of the Republic, a new hero, Socrates. 
Socrates believes that knowledge and inquiry and philosophical ex examination are what is, what is best in life, what it means to lead the best and most just life. Socrates is an educator of people. He seeks to educate their souls, and after all, Plato believes that souls are what we really are. Plato's Republic, then, is an overturning of the Homeric worldview, but it's more than just this. It's about truth and justice and beauty and poetry, aesthetics. It's about how we ought raise our children and how we ought educate ourselves. It's about how we should grow old, how we should face death, and what happens to us when we die. It offers us a tripartite theory of soul. It discusses how we ought best organize ourselves as individuals and the society at large. In sum, the book is about the entire human condition. The Republic is a dialogue which takes place in the course of one night, a discussion among 11 men sitting about in Cephalus's living room in the port town of Athens, the Piraeus, in ancient Greece. And after exchanging pleasantries, the men sitting about in Cephalus's house, really six of them engage in the dialect, six of them engage in this reason and discourse. The others, as might often be the case in a discussion in your own living room, sit about and listen mostly. Don't have that much to say. It takes place in 411 BC in Cephalus's home. And having introduced themselves, the question turns to what is the just life? What is the good life? And at its most basic, Plato's Republic is making the point that philosophy can take place in our living rooms. No special equipment is needed. We simply need to take the view of wonder, of self-examination, have the ability, the desire to open ourselves up to asking questions about what it is we can know, what it is we ought to do. Of course, the hero of Plato's Republic is Socrates. Socrates was Plato's teacher in ancient Athens. Plato studied with Socrates for perhaps 20 years. Socrates led the life of the mind. He had been, of course, in the great Peloponnesian War, the war between Athens and Sparta, a hoplite, a foot soldier. And after the war, he went about questioning the youth of Athens, the youth of Athens, asking them what was it that they believed was important about life. And so in book one, we begin with this question, what does it mean to lead a good life? And the first view we come across is that of Cephalus's old buddies. Socrates says to Cephalus, Cephalus, how is it that life appears to you in your old age? Cephalus is an old man in his 80s. And Cephalus says, well, Socrates, my old buddies and I, when we were young, we had a good life then, but now, now life seems only a cruel joke to us. When we were young, we went out, we went to parties, we engaged our sensual desires, we ate gluttonously, we engaged in orgiastic feasts. But now, Socrates, to my old friends, they really can't seem to generate the sorts of sensual desires, the desires for a high hedonic tone in their lives, in their old age. And so to them, Socrates, life appears to be a cruel joke, as if they are already dead. Plato's point here is that if a meaningful life is to have use, meaning, and importance in youth, in middle age, and in old age, it must be about something more than simply the desire to satiate our sensual physical pleasures, the pleasures we get from tactile enjoyments 
the pleasures we get from eating and drinking and partying with our friends. But if life is to be not just about the high rolling life of sensual pleasures, what is it? We have in the course of Book One of the Republic a series of interlocutors which engage Socrates on this issue, but in turn, and as we will see in Professor Dalton's lecture on the subject, in turn, Socrates dismisses each of these possible views. We can't, Socrates says, simply come to know what the best life is by appealing to an authority. Let's go get Simonides. Let's go get an important book, perhaps Shakespeare. We'll just read Shakespeare. Whatever he says, that must be right. No, Plato says, no. You must yourselves be willing to engage in reasoned speech to yourselves, sit around among your friends and discuss what it is that you yourselves find important. The unexamined life is not worth living. Examination is what we should seek to be and to do. At the end of Book One of the Republic, Socrates has listened to Cephalus, Cephalus' son Polemarchus, and to Thrasymachus assert different views about what they perceive justice to be, the good life to be. He dismisses each of these in turn. And in books two through ten of the Republic, the Republic is composed of ten books. In books two through ten, we find Plato's response, Plato's answer to what it means to lead a good life. At the beginning of book two, Glaucon, Glaucon and Adiamantus, two of the interlocutors in the text, by the way, are Plato's brothers. They actually were Plato's brothers uh, in ancient Greece. Glaucon presses the argument. He says to Socrates, well, Socrates, you're a wise man, and you've shown that Cephalus' view, Polemarchus' view, and Thrasymachus' views in book one make little sense. What is it that you think? And why, Socrates, ought we lead an ethically just life? Look, Socrates, you know, you know, he says, the myth of Gyges. The myth of Gyges was a popular myth, much circulated in ancient Greece. You can read it in Herodotus' histories, various versions floating around. The myth of Gyges was basically this. There was a fellow who was a shepherd, Gyges. Basically, today we might say he was a, a secretary, an auto mechanic, a medical doctor, just like us, going about his business in the world. And one day, a great storm occurred, and the earth opened up, and Gyges went down into the earth, and there he found a bronze horse. Within the bronze horse, he found a golden ring. He put it upon his finger and turned it inward, turned the collet of the ring inward. He went out of the cave, and he noticed something really wild. He noticed that his friends were speaking to him. I beg your pardon. His friends were speaking as if about him as if he weren't even there. This ring was a secret ring, a special ring that gave him the power of invisibility. It gave him the chance, if you will, to remove his body from his soul. And he was, if you want to think of it this way, he was pure soul. And Glaucon says, Socrates, you know what happens in the myth of Gyges. Most people would be like this. Given the power of a god, given the power to be whatever they wanted to be, people would act like Gyges. And what Gyges does in this traditional myth of ancient Greece he comes out, he realizes, check this out. I'm invisible. I have the power of a god. Let's see now. What is it that I'd like to do? I'd like all of the wealth in the kingdom. To, for starters, he goes. No one can see him. He kills the king. He rapes the king's wife. Hedonistic desires. Plato's point, Glaucon's point is, look, if you could be whatever you wanted to be, wouldn't it be to be one of the richest women or men in the world? Wouldn't it be to have the most beautiful sexual partner in the world? Wouldn't it be a life of hedonic, sensual pleasures? This is the question which Glaucon presses the argument with. Socrates responds, no how, Glaucon. If you think that is a contented life, if you think that is the sort of life that you should seek, a life of money, 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 and sex, mm -hmm life of MTV and hedonistic partying pleasures. You've got it very wrong. Instead, Socrates says, the truly contented man is the man or woman who
can come to see the forms, can come to rend the veil of Maya, can come to see beyond the ephemeral world of sensual delights and understand that there is a transcendental absolute. Even, Socrates says, if you are having your eyes gouged out or you are being tormented in the worst possible way, if you are truly philosophically minded, if you know the good, if you are able to achieve knowledge of the idea of the good and keep your mind's eye focused on what is really important about the world, sure it'll cause your body physical pain, but you'll realize that that's not what's important. In response then to the myth of Gyges, Socrates argues that the truly just life, the best life, is the philosophic life, the life of contemplation, the life of the mind, the life which seeks to know truth and beauty and justice in their absolute forms and not merely in the, in the turbulent, changing world around us. In order to explain his view, Socrates offers us his tripartite theory of soul. That is to say, a soul which has three parts. But he doesn't simply do this ex cathedra. He does not simply assert from authority that there must be three parts to the soul. Write it down, that's it. Instead, he goes, sets about proving it using logic. In fact, he introduces for the first time in the West a complete assertion of the fundamental essence of logic the theory of logical contradiction. He has Glaucon agree to the proposition, a proposition which has subsequently certainly been agreed to by Western philosophers, that a thing cannot be both what it is and what it is not at the same time. That is to say, a thing cannot be both A and not A simultaneously. And Glaucon gets a bit confused and so asks some questions and he says, well, but Socrates, for example, you could be standing still, being still, and moving your hands about, not being still. So, me as a person, I am at once what I am and what I am not. And Socrates says, hang on, Glaucon, you sort of missed the point a bit there. What I mean to say is that in the particular point, a hand, if you will, a particular part, cannot be both what it is still and what it is not in motion at the same time. So establishing this theory of logical contradiction, really a brilliant and important contribution in Western philosophy, Socrates then goes on to construct his theory of the tripartite notion of our souls or our personalities or our psyches. He says we have three parts to our soul. He engages Glaucon in the dialectic. Glaucon, is it not the case that you have a rational aspect of your soul, right? You can go home, you can calculate your phone bill, you can do simple mathematical problems, you can indeed even do perhaps more math complex mathematical problems. There's a part of your personality that is inclined toward reason, a, a part of your personality that allows you to engage in dialectic, logos, reasoned speech. And Glaucon says, surely, Socrates, this is the way it appears to me. Is it not also the case, Socrates suggests, that while you're engaging in filling out your tax forms or working on your phone bill, that at the same time, you have another aspect of your soul, a desiring part. You have a great pang in your stomach for lunch. You have a desire which you feel simultaneously with, the with, with your calculation. And so, since the thing cannot be both what it is calculating and what it is not desiring at the same time, Socrates shows to Glaucon, using the theory of contradiction then, that there must be at least two parts to the soul. The mathematical, rational, calculating aspect of the human soul and the desiring part, to eat and drink, the part of us which seeks sensual pleasures. And Glaucon turns to Socrates and says, well, Socrates, that just seems to about do it to me. It looks like we have two parts to our soul. 
And Socrates says, are you satisfied with that glaucon? Glaucon says, yes, Socrates, it seems good. Looks like we're two parts to our psyches. But Socrates says, hang on now, Glaucon, hang on. Have you heard that story of the fellow who was walking from the Piraeus, the seaport, of, seaport town of Athens, on the outside of the long wall, a long stone wall that connected the seaport town with Athens? And as he was walking along, he noticed off in the distance a really horrible scene, a scene of human carnage and bloodshed. A pile of bodies, really ghastly in appearance. And as he walked closer to them, as he walked closer to this horrible sight, he had a desire to feast his eyes upon the blood and the gore. At the same time, Glaucon, you've heard, of course, that he also had a countervailing emotional reaction, a countervailing spirited reaction within him, which said, I am enraged by this feeling I have. These people are dead. It's a horrible situation. I should not be gaining desirous enjoyment from feasting my eyes upon the situation. And so he burst out in great rage. There was then another aspect to his soul an emotional or spirited aspect, which, in the story which Socrates tells, said to his desiring part, feast your eyes, feast with great rage. And so Socrates then develops the idea that if there are these two countervailing notions, a notion of spiritedness or emotion and a feeling of desire, there must be, since the thing cannot be both what it is and what it is not simultaneously, there must be these two countervailing notions of soul as well as that of reason. I think a way in contemporary times of trying to understand what Socrates is saying about the relationship between spiritedness and desire is you're driving down the road and there's a horrible car accident and what do most people do, right? They're driving down the road, the ambulance is there, the police are there, people are being attended to. There's a part of them that recognizes, look, the best thing I can do is to keep driving along. It will help traffic to flow. I can't really be of any help here. It's a horrible, sad situation, this car wreck. But there's another part of them that says, no, no, I'm going to rubberneck. Wow, look at that. It's that which Socrates is after in his juxtaposition of the spirited or emotional and the desiring aspect of soul. And so, employing his theory of contradiction, Socrates asserts, not simply dogmatically, but through a use of logical proof, that there are three parts to our psyches in ancient Greek psuche, or what we might today call our souls or our personalities. There is also, Socrates says, a proper alignment between these three aspects. If you want to lead a good life, you shouldn't lead the sort of life that we find Catholic's buddies leading. We shouldn't lead the sort of life that Gyges leads. That is to say, the life of desire ruling over one's spiritedness. This is the organization of a tyrannical soul, the soul which seeks to reason in order to eat, the soul which has as its goal cheeseburgers, the soul that has as its goal the most greatest celebration of sensuality. I want, I want, I want. Gimme, gimme, gimme. I'm going to satiate my own desires. The soul which is constructed in such a way that desire rules over the spirited and rational parts of the soul is a tyrannical soul, Socrates says. <coughs> it's the sort of soul which Gyges lives. It's the sort of soul which Cephalus's old buddies had in their youth. The best sort of soul is that of the philosopher. The philosophical soul, then, is given Socrates' tripartite theory of soul, that which is ruled by reason and in which spirit and desire follow along. In his dialogue, The Phaedrus, Socrates makes this point. He says, you want to understand how you should really organize these three aspects to your personality? It should be the case, he says in the Phaedrus, 
that reason ought to be the charioteer and that spiritedness and desire ought to be the white and black stallions, powerful, fearsome, passionate horses that pull along the chariot. Never should you allow desire and emotion, desire and spiritedness to run your life. You must always rein them in with your reason. Because, after all, it's reason that makes us different from all the other animals. We imagine that dogs and cats and tigers have desiring aspects and spirited aspects to their soul. But what gives them their arete is not what gives us, as human beings, our own sense of arete, our own sense of what it means to be the best sort of human being we can be, what it means to be a virtuous human being. We have the capacity to engage in reasoned speech and therefore the organization of our souls along the philosophical line of reason ruling over the spirited and desiring aspects of soul, reining them in, reining in the passions of emotion and desire. That is best. Socrates isn't saying, kill off your passions. He's saying, no, it's the passions drive the chariot. But it must be reason that organizes how you run your life. We have then, we have then various alternative organizations, various alternative organizations of soul. A timocratic man, a timocratic an, man, man an honor loving man, an honor loving woman, is a person who has a rather confused soul. It's, on Socrates' view, a second best way of running your life. Someone who desires to get the praise of others. Someone who seeks to use their reason to a degree, but also allows their emotion to get in the way. They want, after all, people to say, oh, that was great. Oh, we really love you. They seek after the, uh, the desire, they seek after the positive uh, pleasures which come from having other people uh, speak to them and tell them that they themselves are good. But they've lost sight of the fact that true goodness is transcendental, that the opinions of mere appearance are not what is important. The oligarchic soul is that soul which seeks to collect money, which seeks to live life only for money uh, and to satiate its emotional desires. And the democratic soul is a soul which is quite terribly confused. On some days, the spirited aspect of soul runs your life. On other days, you're quite calculating and rational. And on still other days, your passions and desires run your life. There is a hierarchy here, from best to worst. The philosophical soul is that which is best. The tyrannical soul, on Plato's view, is that which is worst. We come now, then, to an, another very important question in the Republic. What it means to have a good definition of something. That is to say, what is it that really exists Plato employs an every-only notion of definition. He employs an essential notion or a mathematical notion of definition. If you want to come up with a definition of something, Plato says, you should look to the examples of mathematics. As Professor Staloff told us in the last lecture, the Pythagorean theorem, Pythagoras, the idea that there was in the ancient world number magic, that you could see the relationships between the harmony of music and mathematical relationships between string lengths. Plato was perfectly aware of these notions of Pythagoras and thought that they offered him a key to understanding what it means to have a good definition of something. We should, when we think mathematically, and especially when we use arithmetic and geometry, Try to come up with, for example, what does it mean to have a good definition of a triangle? On Plato's view, it won't do to have your seventh grade teacher draw a picture of a triangle, draw another picture, and another picture. A seventh grader without an essential definition of triangularity will be rather confused. Some of these things will look scalar, other isosceles, other equilateral. It's kind of confusing for a kid to understand a definition by just producing many instantiations of something. 
when you don't really have clear what the general overall view of it is. And Socrates argues this, that in order to come up with a definition of triangularity, we should come up with a definition geometrically, which says this, a, every triangle is a triangle, is a, is a geometrical object with three sides in which internal angles add up to 180 degrees. This is true for every triangle and only for triangles. And so it is this notion of every onlyness. There's not a whole bunch of definitions of triangularity out there, and if you think triangle can be defined in one way, and you think triangle can be defined in another, well, it's all acceptable. Well, I guess this fellow's definition of triangle is okay. Well, it's Thursday, we'll take this definition of triangle. That won't do, Socrates says. You must come up with an essential definition, and every only definition. A triangle is a three-sided figure with angles adding up to 180 degrees. In math, Socrates gives another example. If you're trying to explain to a student what the oddness is in mathematics, what does it mean for a number to be odd? If you say to them, 7, 9, 11, 13, uh, 7, 9, 11, 13, okay, well, yeah, 7, 9, 11, 13, well, what's, what's that? Socrates says it won't do simply to give examples. We have to try to achieve a mathematical or essential definition of a thing. And how he goes about doing that is he says we should give as our absolute eternal notion of definition, we should give as our essential mathematical notion of definition of oddness. Every number which, when divided by two, has a remainder and only such numbers, those are odd numbers. So we have, on Plato's view, articulated by Socrates in the Republic, the notion that oddness is an every-only definition. Every number divisible by two with remainder and only such numbers. They are odd numbers. And here Socrates says, this gets us at what we're after. It is not what we see, the little squiggle your seventh grade teacher makes on the board for number seven. That's not a seven. A seven exists in your intellect. Mathematical intellection is not part of the visible world. It is rather part of an intelligible world, a world of ideas. Socrates comes then to really what is the key of Plato's Republic at the end of book six and the beginning of book seven. He says to Glaucon and Adiamantus and to the other interlocutors sitting about in Cephalus' home, you want to know what I really think? Here is what I think. I think that there's an epistemological or ontological hierarchy, that what is least reliable in the world are images and imaginations. After all, we can dream that we see giant pink elephants, but when we wake up, there's no giant pink elephant in our living room. We can dream that we're on the planet Jupiter, walking around in our spacesuits, so we can daydream. It doesn't mean that it's so. That sort of imagination is least reliable. Socrates says, think about another sort of thinking that we do. The sort of thinking we derive from our senses. From our senses, we have ideas we derive from touching and tasting and smelling things. We see tables and chairs. We see automobiles. We see other human beings. They are born, they grow old, they die, they change. In this realm of senses, we really can't trust that what our senses are telling us is true. Sometimes you think, a little kid, you look into your closet, you think, it's a ghost. And then you realize, no, no, it's not a ghost, it's my skirt. Socrates gives the example, going back to his logical theory of contradiction, late in the Republic, he says, the reason that your sense impressions, the information you get from your senses, is not always right, is, he gives this example, he says, you can a take-home experiment, if you will. He says, you have a stick, which is straight, and you ask, leaving aside your reason, leaving aside your calculation, because I know you will all say it's refracted is the answer, but that's, leave that aside, and just have your senses report to you the realm of things. In the realm of senses, have your senses report to you about the following experiment. We take a straight stick, we immerse it in a pond, halfway. And now what do we see but a crooked stick? Ask your senses, what is the stick? Your senses 
without the help of calculation, without the help of rational thinking, say, the stick is straight and not straight. The stick is straight and not straight? By the logical theory of contradiction, a thing cannot be both what it is and what it is not. Therefore, our senses are also unreliable. Indeed, in climbing this epistemological hierarchy, Socrates says that those things which we can know through our imaginations, things which we can imagine, and things which we can learn through our senses are least reliable in life. That in fact, these things are, exist in what he calls the visible world, the world we see with our eyes, touch with our hands, smell, and hear with our ears, etc. This realm is not very reliable. In fact, he calls it a barbaric bog, a quagmire of confusions. You can't rely on your imagination to tell you what's true. You certainly can't rely also on your senses always to be giving you the right information. He says, however, we're not like animals. Other animals in the animal kingdom, we possess more than just imaginations. After all, we imagine we see our dog. He wakes up from his nap sometimes and oh, chases around. It appears he had a dream, right? So maybe animals have imaginations. Certainly, it appears that animals see tables and chairs. They don't go banging around into things. But can any animal take your pet, try to teach it basic math? No, it doesn't work. We as human beings possess rational souls, just as Socrates asserted that there are three aspects to soul, so we find in this divided line, an epistemological hierarchy, that there is an entire realm of ideas of intellection, an intelligible realm, a realm in which we as human beings come to be what we are best at. We find our arete. The arete of a horse, after all, is to run swiftly. The arete of a dog is to be a fierce fighter. The arete, or virtue, of a human being is to become intelligent through the use of their capacity to engage in reasonable speech and mathematics. And so Socrates climbs this epistemological hierarchy by arguing that this realm, the realm of ideas, is really the best realm. In fact, it goes to the very issue that if you are being tortured on the rack in life, it doesn't bother you because you have your mind's eye, your capacity to engage in reason, focused in quite another realm, in the rational realm. And indeed, Socrates says in the course of the Republic, if you educate your children and yourselves to move away from the imaginative confusions of believing that what you see on sitcoms, on TV, is what is really real, and you're even able to overcome the notion that what is best is your sense impressions, you will come to see that the dedicated life of the mind, the mind which engages in rational mathematical discourse, is what is best. In fact, after 50 years of education, you can, on Socrates' view, come to a philosophical perspective, that is to say, a dialectical perspective, a dialectical perspective in which we find that philosophy is possible. You come to be able to see the theory of forms. Uh, there is a non-predicable thing which is best, the true essence of all things, which is one and immutable and unchanging. This division of one's soul into the rational, the sensual, and the desiring is what is called the divided line. And after he explains this divided line to Glaucon in Book Six of the Republic, Glaucon, not being altogether uh, on top of his game, says, huh? I don't quite get it, Socrates. Could you explain again? Socrates says, okay, Glaucon, let's look at it this way. Imagine, Socrates says to Glaucon, I'm after the same basic point here going to try to articulate why it is that we as human beings can know that there is a transcendental absolute. Why is that the case, he says? You know, most people, Socrates asserts, live their lives as if chained in a dark cave. This is a dark cave well underground. The people have their heads shackled and forced to look at a cave wall. This is the famous allegory of the cave in Book 7 of the Republic, and it's the essence of what Plato is after. 
Most people, they believe when they watch TV that what they see on TV is really real. Huh? You know, you see Dookie Hauser on TV and people write to Dookie, Dear Dookie, I'm not feeling so well. You're a medical doctor. Please help me, right? Dookie Hauser's only an actor. He doesn't know the art of doctoring. Most people are confused by the false images they perceive presented to them in the popular culture. Most people think that what's important in life is getting together with your friends and going out to hear rock music and getting all stimulated and getting all uh, sensually tingly. Huh? Socrates says, no, no. The masses of men and women lead lives of quiet desperation, believing in the darkness of the cave that the images projected here, the images projected by myth makers who assert the stories that the popular culture believes in, the poets, the people who write scripts for television shows, those sorts of people make up stories. And from a dimly lit fire in the cave, that is to say, in the confused life of sensuality, the confused life of sense impressions and imagination, people believe that what's important in their life is the projections they see in their popular culture, the projections of the poets and myth makers. Those projections illuminated by a weak fire behind them are projected much more largely onto the cave wall. The spirit of things then understood by the masses of people is that all there is is the veil of illusion. All there is is the changing, ever-changing world of appearances. Socrates says, imagine this. Imagine that a person could be dragged up forcefully out of the cave and being dragged up out of this deep cave set into the ground they were to come out of the confused appearances of the depths of what they think is real but is really not best they are brought forcibly out of the cave through education through engaging in dialectic they come out of the cave into the light of the noonday sun. All their lives, they've been of the view that popular culture, they've been of the view that what everybody else in the culture thinks, sensual pleasures, making a lot of money, you know, that sort of stuff, that's what's best. And they are brought through engaging in dialectic, through reasoned speech, dragged forcibly by hard education. By in fact, Plato intimates, reading the Republic, <laughs> they are brought into the light of the noonday sun. And at first, the sun is too bright. At first, all their lives, lived, having lived in a dark cave, they can't see the forms. They can see only at first the reflections of things in a pond. And that, if you remember back to our discussion a minute ago of the divided line, those reflections are the mathematical capacities that Socrates was speaking about. The ability that we ourselves can do math, simple math and geometry. At first, when you engage in a disciplined education, you can see only the reflection of the forms, only the reflection of that which truly is. But after a while, your eyes become accustomed to engaging in dialectic, to sitting around in school, reading great books like Plato's Republic, and you see that what is best about the human spirit is the reasoning aspect of our souls. You're able finally not to be blinded in your education, but to see the forms. That is to say, for Socrates, to see that which really is. You rend, you pull apart the curtain of appearances and you see into being itself. The philosopher then is such a person. The philosopher is able to engage the life of the mind to know that through reasoned speech we can come to remove ourselves from believing in the false images of popular culture, not believing the poets and myth makers, through hard disciplined education. And is it at first very interesting or is it at first very fun. No, it hurts, right? The point of the Republic is disciplined education. Reading this book, reading the Republic is tough. It's not a simple thing to do. But if you bring yourself out of the cave into the light of the sun, you will be illuminated 
by the sun up in the sky. And Plato's point about the sun for Glaucon is, you remember back to the, to the discussion in the divided line, he says, well, if you aren't quite following me, Glaucon, in terms of that dialectic, think of it this way. It's as if the entire universe, it's as if the entire universe, all of our world, is illuminated by one great transcendental goodness and beauty and truth. And that if you climb into the life of the mind, if you are through study, intellection, come out of the cave, you will be able to see in the light of that truth. And so, just as the sun brings warmth and enlightenment to us in our common day life, by analogy, Socrates is saying, the transcendental good, the forms, that which we know through dialectical study and mathematics, that which is best. And if you keep your eye, you keep your mind's eye focused on that good, you will never be bothered by the physical torments and tortures of life. And so it means, in sum, that the philosopher leads the best life, the life of the mind. The philosopher is the woman or man who can come to know that which is, to rend the veil of appearances and see reality for what it truly is. In the next lecture, we will take up Plato's discussion of what it means to lead a good political order. Who among these people ought to lead society? And we'll find out that it is the intellectuals, the philosophers, the philosopher kings, the philosopher kings, women and men who know the good that ought to be in control of society and that democracy is a mistake.